Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, fine. Uh, hello? I'm the Batman. I mean, I'm, uh, hello, I'm Bruce Wayne. Who is Bruce Wayne? With great power comes great responsibility. Are you doing Batman? Where is she? Tom, if you keep doing this, we're gonna get sued. I have so much money. I'm Batman. No, you're not Batman. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full breakdown Easter eggs video for the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. There's a whole bunch of references, so we'll break it all down. Whole bunch of cameo scenes too. Like there was even a stealth Mark Hamill cameo scene that some of you may have spotted. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I'll be doing a bunch of Guardians of the Galaxy 3 videos soon, and we have Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania coming. We're gonna get another trailer for that really soon as well. Careful for spoilers from the entire special if you haven't seen it yet, but there's no special subtitle, it's just called Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. It's meant to be Marvel's version of the Star Wars Holiday Special from 1978. The title is kind of the same, the font is a little bit the same. Marvel's whole thing with the special presentations are based on the original CBS special presentations, which is what the Star Wars Holiday Special was. Also, the Mark Hamill cameo scene at the end of the special, like you see him as one of the Ravagers during the big celebration montage, that's meant to be another reference to the Star Wars Holiday Special because he played Luke Skywalker during that. They did have a new Marvel Studios intro themed for Christmas for the holidays, and normally when you have all the comic book pages flipping through the beginning of the logo as it transitions to the different scenes, usually all the comics are based on whichever characters the movie is about, like the Guardians of the Galaxy comic book pages during their movies. But this time, because it's a holiday special, like a Christmas special, all the pages are from the Marvel holiday special comics, that's why you see Santa Claus in some of these images. Because Santa Claus is a mutant in the MCU, he's an Omega level mutant, one of the most powerful ones there are. The Marvel holiday special comics have been a thing going on since 1991. They've done special event comics way back to the beginning of Marvel comics, but the actual holiday specials didn't start till 1991, and in number one is when they canonized Santa as a mutant in the MCU. The other brand new thing that you probably spotted in the intro are She-Hulk scenes and Shuri Black Panther scenes from the end of that movie. Because this is literally coming out right after Black Panther Wakanda Forever came out and they usually update it every single time a brand new Marvel movie or Marvel Disney Plus series comes out. The song that's playing over this opening title is one of the original songs that James Gunn did with the old 97's band who themselves were playing aliens living on nowhere with the Guardians of the Galaxy here. They did two original songs for this and one of them was sung by Kevin Bacon at the end because Kevin Bacon is a musician in real life in addition to being an actor. If you didn't know, he has a band with his brothers called The Brothers Bacon and they've released six albums so far. A lot of the lyrics of both of the original songs are meant to highlight the action of the actual episode, like not totally understanding what Christmas is, the Guardians of the Galaxy, the other people on Nowhere not really knowing what Christmas is, having all these misconceptions about Santa Claus. The funny thing about that old 97 song about Santa Claus being this terrible person the elves plotting his demise is that in the Marvel Holiday Special comics, Santa actually wore the Infinity Gauntlet once and fought the Illuminati. The basic premise of the episode is that Mantis wants to cheer Peter Quill up by throwing him a Christmas that he'll really enjoy. James Gunn said up to this point she's been a relatively minor character and he wanted to show her up more fully, like become a much bigger part of the team than she seemed like in the past. The actual opening scene is an animated flashback of Kraglin telling the story of the first Christmas that Peter Quill tried to throw and teach him and Yondu about it, and Yondu being this super big Grinch. The actual style of the animation looks very similar to the heavy metal animated movie from the 80s too. But it's basically them celebrating that first Christmas on the Eclector ship. And obviously you find out the rest of the story at the end, but the whole joke here at the beginning is that they think that it was a rotten Christmas because Kraglin never heard the rest of the story and they only know about Christmas after hearing Kraglin talk about it. I believe Peter Quill is meant to be like 12, 13 years old during this. Like he's still really, really young, but he's been with the Ravagers for a little while at this point. Michael Rooker did come back to play his character, so it's like brand new Michael Rooker stuff, but it is a flashback. The ship that they're on, the Eclector, is part of the larger Ravagers home base ship. They blew up part of it during Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but this part of the ship will be back in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. All the decorations on the tree there are just random electrical parts that he found across the ship. When Yondu references the fires of Ogard, that's a reference to Starhawk, Sylvester Stallone's character from Guardians 2. His real name is Stakar Ogard. He was the leader of the Guardians 3000, the original Guardians of the Galaxy team in the Marvel comics. In the MCU, the whole story is that that was Yondu's original team because in the comics, way back in the day, Yondu was on that very first Guardians of the Galaxy 3000 comic book team. But the whole idea here is that Peter Quill is giving him one of those little toys that he keeps around on the Eclector into present day. Like you see little toys that Yondu has, like the troll doll during the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. 
All those are meant to be little things that Peter Quill has given to him across the years. There are several of them, meaning that they had several Christmas celebrations like this across the years. The joke about cleaning the latrines being Jeff's favorite job is a Stephen Agee joke. He's the one that plays Jeff during Guardians of the Galaxy 2, this character here. He shows up in most of James Gunn's projects, like he was just in Peacemaker 2. There were actually a lot of actors from the Suicide Squad movie in Peacemaker, which James Gunn both made. So a lot of James Gunn recurring actors showed up as cameos during this. The place that they're on right now is nowhere. They explained during the special that they bought it from the collector, meaning that the collector would have had to survive Avengers Infinity War for them to buy it from him in the first place. So that's actually a pretty big reveal that he's still alive. We all thought that he died during Infinity War. The multi-calendar that Kraglin mentions just contains important dates from cultures all across the universe. So I could have important Asgardian dates, important dates from Earth, important dates from all over the place. Some of the street signs that you see down on the street there, like there's a neon wrath sign, those were featured during the first two Guardians of the Galaxy movies. They reintroduce Cosmo the Talking Dog because we saw her during the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Her full name from the comics is Cosmo the Talking Dog. She's based on Laika, the Russian space dog from the 1950s. The difference with the MCU origin story is that Cosmo was fired into space, bombarded with cosmic rays, and wound up on nowhere, and that's how she wound up in the collector's collection. The reason James Gunn said that she wasn't a bigger character in the previous Guardians of the Galaxy movies is just because he already had the talking raccoon, the talking tree, and he felt like at the beginning when he was first starting the franchise, putting a talking dog on top of that throughout the entire movie would have just been too much too soon. She's voiced by Maria Bakalova, and the reason why she's wearing the Soviet Union space uniform is because that was when she was fired into space, when the Soviet Union still existed. And that's why when you hear her telepathic thoughts, her voice sounds like it's Russian because she grew up in Russia, so she has a Russian accent. In the comics, Cosmo is a male dog. The reason why it's a girl in the MCU is because James Gunn wanted to be truer to the source material, and because Cosmo is based on Laika, the real-life Russian space dog, in real life Laika was a female dog. They give you a little tutorial on how her powers work. She uses telekinesis. She has telepathy to talk, so she kind of beams her thoughts into your head. She doesn't move her lips. And as the old 97 sing the Christmas song, they play opening credits, which Marvel usually doesn't do. Most of their credits come at the end of their movies. The actual lettering is also Christmas themed as well. They reintroduce the bigger now teenage version of Groot, who's grown much larger, thick Groot, Chad version of Groot, however you want to think of him. This is mostly to get him ready for Guardians of the Galaxy 3, where I think he'll eventually grow back to regular full size. Drax and Mantis come up with their idea to cheer Peter Quill up by throwing the celebration for him and yoinking the legendary Kevin Bacon, who they think is this grand hero, leader of all Earth. Like, Drax actually thinks that he is the leader of the entire planet. The other joke here, too, is that Drax says that he hates stories where everyone lives, and this story is one of the few Guardians of the Galaxy stories where no one actually dies. They also make a lot of meta jokes about hating actors, like, oh, actors, so terrible, I hate them, and Mantis tries to throw up just at the thought of an actor, when they're all literally actors playing characters in this production. So they're kind of clowning on themselves in a meta way. The reason why they thought of Kevin Bacon is because Peter Quill believes that Footloose is the greatest movie of all time and won't shut up about it. You remember that he left Earth in 1988, so all of his knowledge of pop culture and movies, everything, is just frozen in the 80s. So I believe the last Kevin Bacon movie that he might have seen would have been Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which is also a Thanksgiving movie, like this was released during Thanksgiving. They introduce Kevin Bacon, who's playing himself the actor inside the MCU. All kinds of jokes about the weird continuity issues because he played a version of Sebastian Shaw in the Fox Marvel X-Men movies. It's kind of like Samuel L. Jackson playing Nick Fury, but also being Mace Windu in the Star Wars movies, which are canon to the MCU. The Kira that he talks to on the phone is his wife in real life, Kira Sedgwick. That is her voice on the phone, so she did have a small cameo scene. Drax and Mantis take off of Nowhere. We get a really cool shot of it. We haven't actually seen Nowhere in an MCU production since the first Guardians of the Galaxy film. The brand new ship that they're on, the brand new Guardian ship, is called the Bowie after David Bowie because all their ships are named after 70s and 80s pop stars. The first one was the Milano after Alyssa Milano. The second one was the Benatar after Pat Benatar and now David Bowie. It actually looks pretty cool. I actually like this ship the best. Because of the Eternals movie, we've been going deeper into Celestial's lore in the MCU. So Nowhere is the head of a dead Celestial. In the comics, it was Null that killed that Celestial. It was originally the green one that you saw in the Eternals movie, Jemiah the Analyzer. In the MCU, they could say that Galactus was the person who killed this Celestial. 
when they arrive in Los Angeles on planet Earth, the whole joke, everybody freaking out, is that they think there's another alien invasion. Remember, this is meant to be Christmas 2025 when this is taking place. So the Earth has already been through several invasions. They already know about the stone celestial inside the Indian Ocean. So everyone's freaking out like, oh no, not another alien invasion. Like another Thanos character has come back to take over. This is the real Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles that they filmed in at Man's Chinese Theater. This area is also rife with cosplayers that do a lot of Marvel characters that you can pay to take pictures with, which they use for a lot of comedy during this particular scene. The Acura ad in the background seems like it's a depiction of Wakandans, even Black Panther on it. Part of the joke here too is that the other regular humans think that they're also cosplayers and pay them a bunch of money. We see versions of Captain America, Iron Man, Spider-Man, Ant-Man, Black Widow, Captain Marvel, the other Avengers that they've known in real life. They have a joke about that too. Mantis thinking that it's the real Captain America. I also love the idea that she hates Captain Marvel for some reason. Like she can't stand Captain Marvel. She would have only met her for like a couple minutes during Avengers Endgame. They have references to Zorro, Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. This is a really funny GoBot reference. They're 80s ripoffs of Transformers. I remember watching that television show and having some of those GoBot toys. Peter Quill would know about the GoBots because they were around during the early 80s. And apparently Drax thinks a GoBot killed his cousin, which they pay off later when he beats the hell out of that GoBot cosplayer. RIP to that guy. The mom here that thinks that he's cosplaying Kratos, God of War, is actually James Gunn's real life sister-in-law. She's been in a bunch of his productions as well. So there's a whole bunch of Easter eggs going on in this scene. They actually just released the latest God of War game. There's a real quick blink and you'll miss it reference to one of Kingo's recent Christmas movies that he made before the Eternals were yoinked by Ersham the Judge at the end of that movie. Remember, he got yoinked off a planet, meaning that he would have made this movie before that happened and they're just releasing it now because the events of the Eternals movie take place way before the events of this. The bar that they go to, Yarvos, is a reference to James Gunn's friend in real life, David Yaroveski, who goes by the nickname Yarvo. He directed Brightburn, which James Gunn also produced. And if you didn't realize, the music they're playing in the bar, the Blondie, is 70s, 80s music because all the music from the Guardians movies is from the 70s. They're kind of creeping into the 80s now in terms of mixtape music. But the bartender you probably recognize is Flula Borg, who was also in the Suicide Squad movie. The other Easter egg here is that in the Suicide Squad movie, Pom Clementiev, who plays Mantis, also cameoed as one of the dancing girls at the bar they visit during that film. They use the star maps, which are also a real thing you can actually buy to find Kevin Bacon's house. Like you can go on tours in the Hollywood Hills of stars houses. This person is Rusty Schwimmer, you probably recognize from some TV show. She's been in a billion different things. She uses her power to steal the money in the map. That also foreshadows her using her powers on Kevin Bacon. Then on the actual map, they have all kinds of Easter eggs and references here. So they have John Cena and Margot Robbie's house because of the Suicide Squad movie, Harley Quinn, Peacemaker, which James Gunn directed. One of the other jokes here is that a lot of these other people were all big stars during the 80s because Peter Quill left Earth in the 80s. He'd remember them. He'd have seen movies and TV shows with them in it. Like apparently he watched Saved by the Bell, knew about that. So he knew about Mark Paul Gossler playing a version of Zach Morris. He also knew about Arnold Schwarzenegger because of his 80s movies. The last Schwarzenegger movie he probably saw was the Twins movie. And also, if it wasn't obvious, these aren't the actual locations of where these celebrities live. Like they're just random locations around the Los Angeles area. Like the house that they go to isn't Kevin Bacon's house in real life. When they go to Kevin Bacon's house, the Christmas movie that's playing on the TV is Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, which is an old 60s movie, a reference to Drax and Mantis invading Earth, so to speak, stealing Kevin Bacon. There's also a joke line here that he listens to about never coming back to Earth because there's a bit of a joke at the end of the special, like maybe Kevin Bacon won't come back to Earth, even though they do wind up bringing him back. When they start chasing Kevin Bacon down, they also use this scene to show you some of their powers in a way they haven't done before. Like they do have super strength, Mantis can also move a little bit like Spider-Man. When the police show up to help him, this actress is also from the Suicide Squad movie. This upside down cop that Drax almost killed is also real life Barry Curtis, who's Marvel's real life head of security. He had similar types of cameos in a bunch of other Marvel movies playing in-universe security guards and cops because that's basically what he does for Marvel in real life. Like anytime there's a big leak or somebody steals something from Marvel or there's like some big legal problem, he usually gets involved with that. The Christmas store signage is also meant to be the same font as the opening titles, which is where they get all the decorations from that they put up later on Nowhere. We find out that Mantis knows all about Fonz from Happy Days because Peter Quill would have watched reruns of that show and he's talked to them about all of the pop culture bands and TV shows and movies that he liked. They have a big conversation about the Footloose movie, obviously because of the big reference during Avengers Infinity War. They talk to him about the dance-off to save the universe because at the end of the Footloose movie, they have the big dance-off. 
Also, like I said, Peter Quill thinks that Footloose is the greatest movie of all time. They reference the Friday the 13th movie, the first one, which Kevin Bacon was in, if you forgot. He also jokes about not actually killing Jason, like he didn't actually die in the first movie. They make all the actor jokes, like actors suck, Kevin Bacon, you suck, pretend like you don't suck. He pretends to be a British soldier with a British accent from World War II. He makes a Batman reference, so Batman is now canon to the MCU. I think this is the first time they've actually referenced Batman in the MCU. The Kevin Bacon Batman joke is also a super deep cut reference to a Jim Carrey joke from back in the day on The Tonight Show when he did an impression of Kevin Bacon as Batman. Kevin Bacon is Batman! <laughs> cool, cool. That is cool, I know. I don't think that Kevin Bacon ever auditioned for any of the older Batman movies in real life, but if you think he did, write in the comments below. Love that they surprised Peter with him gift wrapped inside a box like a present. Then after Craglin tells him about the dance-off to save the universe, the Footloose dance-off to save the universe, he comes around and sings the original song that they wrote with the old 97s. Because like I said, he's a performer in real life, like he's an actual musician, so he can actually sing. The joke about him getting the cell phone reception all the way across the galaxy is just that their tech allows them to receive signals from across the universe, which they reference during Thor Love and Thunder. Like, oh, we're getting signals from all over the universe. As they begin exchanging Christmas gifts, he gives Groot an original Game Boy. This is original hardware because Groot likes video games. He plays handheld games. The last one we saw him playing during Avengers Infinity War was a portable version of Defender, which was an original arcade game from 1981. You can let me know in the comments which games you think Groot is going to be playing on this first. Then big WTF Christmas gift, Nebula actually gets Rocket Winter Soldier's Vibranium Arm. And this is the current one that was given to him during Avengers Infinity War. Paying off the Infinity War Easter egg, I'm going to get that arm. And he did get that arm. So now you're wondering, is there like a Winter Soldier running around on Earth that's armless? How's he going to get that back? And this is taking place after the events of Falcon and Winter Soldier. We know Bucky is going to be back during the Thunderbolts movie, probably Captain America 4 as well. Because Peter Quill was so quick to want to return Kevin Bacon to Earth, he probably did the same thing eventually with Winter Soldier's arm. Like, dude, we got to take this back to Winter Soldier. You just have to imagine Nebula showing up and wrecking him like I'm taking that arm one way or the other. Cosmo brings a dead animal for Kraglin, which is a joke about your pets in real life, like cats and dogs bringing you dead animals and just leaving them lying around the driveway or the house. Mantis gives Drax the elf that he thought that he had lost, and Groot's present to everyone are little wooden dioramas depicting the events of the holiday special built from pieces of himself, like all this wood is from Groot the way the Stormbreaker's handle is from Groot. It starts at the beginning of them on the balcony, then them chasing Kevin Bacon on Earth, Drax almost killing the police, revealing Kevin Bacon in the giant gift box, and the last one is a diorama of Kraglin holding a diorama of himself, holding an even smaller diorama of himself, like it's a model of a model of a model. Because Groot grew this, you wonder how small he could actually go, like how many versions of Kraglin holding this in this scene here. He would have had to have made this, like literally right on the spot. You may remember a couple years ago when James Gunn was still writing Guardians of the Galaxy 3, he had this big meeting with Mark Hamill, so we all theorized that he would be in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Obviously, it's been a long time since then. A bunch of stuff happened. He might still be in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, but their meeting could have just led to this holiday special cameo scene. The other big surprise is that Kevin Bacon implies that he's going to visit them an Easter of next year during another holiday, so to speak. And I think that's meant to flow with the whole idea of the post credit scene, that there will be another holiday special. There will be more specials. Peter Quill reveals the rest of the story from that first Christmas with Yondu, the Taserface reference because he was a Ravager for a long time before he rebelled. Yondu's Grinch heart melting and giving a gift to Peter Quill as well, giving him the two blasters. The gift that was given to Yondu, as I said earlier, is one of the little toys that you see in present day. Like he gave him many different gifts across the years. The troll doll during the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie is another example of that from a later Christmas. And when they take off at the end of the episode, they sit down. The ship that they're on is the same Eclector ship from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Mantis tells Peter Quill the truth about being his half-sister from Ego the Living Planet. I love the way she tells him, too. He's my father, too. So, like, the wheels start turning in his head, like, wait a minute, you're my sister? They actually revealed this back during Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but I think it just got lost in the shovel because there was so much of an info dump with a bunch of stuff going on in that movie. Like, I believe in the big montage of him getting it on with the entire universe here. In the background, you see a member of Mantis's race. That's meant to be her mother. And she wasn't born with the same type of ability that he was looking for that Peter Quill had so that he could take over the universe. But she did have a special ability that was useful to him, which is why he didn't kill her like the other children. 
Then in the actual post credit scene, they have Rocket and Cosmo dressed and grew up like a Christmas tree because he is a talking tree, which he gets tired of, and they claim that he's ruined Christmas again, and now they have to do a whole other special which is just a larger reference to them doing more holiday specials in the future. I already talked about the Deadpool Christmas special. I'll post a link for that at the end of this and down in the description below. The other big thing here too is that Rocket was breaking the fourth wall, which is pretty rare in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, but they've done it before in the MCU a couple times. Obviously Deadpool will do it as well when he comes to the MCU. Then I believe within the next couple of months inside the MCU, like looking in real time into early 2026, that's when the events of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania take place in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I believe they're both meant to take place around the same time. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is also meant to be the very first Marvel Phase 5 movie, like the beginning of Marvel Phase 5. We'll get a new trailer for that and a new Guardians of the Galaxy 3 trailer really soon. So of course, I'll do a bunch of videos for all that stuff. Be sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that. Everyone click here for my Deadpool Christmas special video and click here for that new Spider-Man and Daredevil clip with them going up against Kingpin. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.